Well, I want to read this passage over you standing because there's certain things that you can only hear standing. And I want you to hear this word of God that he's placed in my heart to declare over you. In Romans 7, Paul is at a tough spot. There's things that he wants to do that he doesn't do. And there's things that he says, God, I'll never do. And he ends up doing it again. You've been there. And at the moment, he feels so guilty. He feels so shameful. He feels such like a failure. And and he's wondering, God, could you still love me after what I did? And he's just done some crazy things and he's not proud of it. And he looks around and says, oh, what a miserable person I am. I feel so miserable. I feel so defeated. I I feel like trash. I I feel like I'm just stuck. I can't go forward. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Who who can actually speak a word into my situation and begin to change me from the inside out? Because I feel lost. I feel hurting. I feel so full of shame. And his answer comes in 25. For thanks be to God who delivers me, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says, I have a savior and I have a hope and his name is Jesus Christ. And so I want you to see this because I'm going to set up Romans 8 is where we're going to be in this weekend. I'm going to set it up because Paul just said, I feel miserable, but he says, I'm, I'm beginning to focus on what Christ did for me. And he gets to the end of Romans chapter eight. And this is what I want to preach over you. It's what I want to speak over you. Every single person that is watching, this is the word of God that he wants to declare over you. For I am convinced, Paul said, I am confident, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate you, will be able to separate me, will be able to separate us from what, Paul? From the love of God that is mine in Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what we celebrate today. So will you join me right now? Our location's online. Will you pray with me? God, I pray that you would take that truth from Romans 8 that we're going to study and you'd make it come alive. Lord, without Christ, we have no hope. Without Christ, every single person is going, I'm miserable. But praise God, there's hope today. Praise God, there's salvation day. Praise God, there's breakthrough and deliverance today. Praise God that we don't stay stuck in our sin and death any longer. Thank you that you sent a Savior. And so, God, I want to thank you that nothing, 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 shout nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so we gather on this day to celebrate and to study your word. Would you let that truth become alive within people? Because I know right now, God, I know right now there's a teenager wondering after what they did, could you ever love them? Lord, I know there's a a college student right now that's wondering, God, do you really have a good plan for their life? God, there's a man, there's a woman that are going through a difficulty and they're going through a sickness, God. And I'm I'm just, in this moment, they're going through such a pressing, pressing time. And God, they feel such like a failure. They're wondering, God, do you still love them? Are you still good in their situation? God, I pray that you would speak a word that is powerful, that is greater than our circumstances, that you would let your word come alive, that we can say by the time we're done reading through Romans 8, that we can say, I am confident that nothing, nothing, nothing will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. So it's in that great name of Jesus Christ, we pray in his glorious name and God's people shout, amen, amen. Hey, as you're finding your seat, will you just turn to the two people and ask him, ask them, hey, can you believe God did that? Can you believe God did that? Can you believe that God did that? And so I'm going to try to do the impossible. And that is preach through Romans 8 in one sitting. Last time I preached through Romans 8, it took me eight weeks. So who knows how long this is going to go? But I want to talk about what hit me was the beauty of this passage that you go from Romans 7, where Paul says, I know what I did. And what I did, I'm not proud of it. What I did, I should not have done. And I feel so guilty for what I did. I feel so broken for what I did. I feel so much like a failure because of what I did. And he's so consumed on it. He says, I'm such a miserable person. But then all of a sudden, he gets to the end of Romans 8. And he says, I am confident that my God is for me and that he loves me. And my question is, what 
pushed Paul to get from this point where he says, I feel so worthless, to get to this point where he's praising? What brought him to the point where he feels discouraged, but now he's walking in victory? What caused, what allowed him to begin to see something he missed before? That in the moment where he went from such depression to such rejoicing, Because what God did in Paul's life and in my life, he wants to do in your life. What happened? And that's what began to allow me to ask that question. And I think what happened is Paul decided that he was going to stop focusing on what he did. And he was going to start focusing on what God did. You see, he made a decision that if I just focus on what I did, I'm going to live in condemnation. If I just focus on what I did, I'm going to live in shame. If I just focus on what I did, I'm going to live in brokenness. But I don't have to focus on what I did. I'm going to focus on what God did. And that's what gives me the confidence to go forward. Paul says, my confidence, what shifted in me, my confidence comes from what God did for me in my life. My confidence comes from the living God who is for me. And so Paul says, that's my whole essence of what I do. That I have found a confidence in that moment where I wonder, God, do you really love me anymore? God, do you really care for me anymore? God, are are you really, do you have a good plan for me based off what I did? Because I know what I did and I'm not proud of it. God, lead me to a place where I'm no longer confident in what I did. But lead me to a place where I'm confident in what you did. And so the question we have to ask, if that's the case, is what did God do? What did God do? What did God do that places us and would give us such a confidence and we could say, nothing will separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? What Paul does in Romans 8 is he keys in not on what you did, but he keys in on what God did. And so I want to spend our time going through this text verse by verse through this incredible chapter, the magnus opus of the Bible, the greatest, the greatest chapter in the greatest book that ever existed and unpack for you what God did so that you would stop focusing on what you did. Because focusing on what you do is just going to lead you in more shame and guilt. What's going to give you the confidence to go forward is when you focus on what God did. I asked my dad one time, I said, Dad, after 50 years of ministry, what's the one thing that you've seen that changed people's lives? And he says, when they get to a point where they're fully assured that God loves them, not based on what they did, but based on what God did for them. That's what's changing. If you never see that, you're going to struggle in the Christian life. Too many people who are following Christ, it's not that they give up because they haven't tried. No, they give up because they tried and then they failed and they get hit with condemnation and guilt and shame that they keep going and they feel like they can't move past the very brokenness they're in. And so Paul says, it's not about what I did, but about what God did. And so what did God do? The first thing, if you're taking notes, and I hope you take notes, go ahead and steal our Journey Church pen that we gave you and take some notes with it. God did. Here's what God did. I can be confident that God entirely forgives me. I can be confident that God entirely, completely forgives me from top to bottom. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now, shout now, Not future, not later, but right now. There's right now no condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Actually translated, there's not a possibility of ever again being condemnation against you. There can never be another time where God is going to pour out his judgment, his wrath upon you for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, why? Because through Christ Jesus, through what Christ did, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For the law what the law was powerless to do, what you could not do on your own because you were weakened by the sinful flesh. You were weakened by the flesh. What you could not do, God, what? Did. Shout, God did. It's not what I did. It's what God did. Well, what did God do? That God sent his one and only son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, to be a very offering for me so that he could condemn sin in the flesh. This is rich. What Paul says is that the moment Jesus Christ came, he lived the perfect life that we should have lived. And then on the cross, he willingly gave his life as a sacrifice. So he's standing in your place as a substitute for you. That on the cross, he says, treat me as if I'm the one who did all the things that they did. Pour out the wrath on me. Pour out the judgment on me. And that on the cross, 
Jesus took my punishment, my wrath, my brokenness, and he absorbed it on himself. The full wrath of God was poured upon Christ Jesus for my sin, not his sin, but for my sin. This is why the word says there is now no condemnation. The word condemn means to charge against you, to bring up a charge for a debt that you owe based on something you've done. Now, all of us have done wrong. All of us. No one is perfect. All of us are guilty. All of us. And so what God did is he gave Christ Jesus as our sacrifice. So the moment we believe in him, the wrath of God, the justice of God for what I did was poured upon Christ Jesus. So that means God can no longer pour out his anger on my sin because that would be in that moment making me pay for what Jesus already paid for. This is how you understand it. You you see, Jesus paid that for me. So when the evil one comes up and says, hey, here's what you did. Here's what you did. You need to pay. You need to pay. You need to pay. You got to rise up and say, it's already been paid for. That Jesus came and he was condemned in the flesh for my sin. He took my sin so that I can be forgiven. But it just doesn't end there. You see, because condemnation takes care of your past. But look what he continues to say. In order that, so there's more to it. In order that, in order that what, Paul? In order that, the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled or might be met in us. So the moment I believe in Christ, not only is my past canceled, the debt of sin canceled, but God takes actually the perfection of Jesus and applies it to my account as if I had committed every single law there was, if I had fulfilled the law perfectly. So that now, because of my faith in Christ Jesus, God looks at me and says, you have completely fulfilled all the law, so there's nothing else I have to do. There's nothing else you have to do. There's nothing about what you did as what God did in Christ Jesus that in that moment I am declared righteous and holy before the living God. This is why God cannot love me less and he can't love me more because his love isn't based on me, it's based on Christ. You see, God doesn't love me because I'm like Christ. No, 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 no. God loves me because I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ Jesus. So that means my wrath and the anger that I deserve was put on him and now his righteousness is given to me because he was my sacrifice. This is why Paul can say, there is therefore now no, absolutely no condemnation. This is a powerful passage, so powerful. My son, he says, dad, when I turn 18, I want a tattoo. I said, are you sure, son? I mean, that's a big decision at 18. I mean, that stays with you for life. And he says, I want a tattoo. I said, okay. I said, what are you going to get? He says, I want Romans 8, 1. Tattooed on my arm. And so he tattooed in Greek, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And I said, why? Out of all the passages, why that passage, son? He says, because dad, I'm an achiever. And I see all the things I fail at. And I'm constantly reminded of my failure, of what I could have done more of. And he says, I feel so like a failure and I feel so worthless that I wonder, could God ever love me after what I did? And he said, every time I enter in that, I want to be able to lift up my arm and read what's been read over me. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because what I could not do, God, you did. At that moment, I said, son, go ahead, get a tattoo. (laughs) You see, you got to remind yourself there is complete forgiveness in Christ Jesus, complete forgiveness unconditional love and absolute acceptance by God the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that you are completely forgiven. But there's another one and another one. Here's another one. Here's what God did. God personally leads me. God personally leads me. God not only just forgives you, God personally takes up residency in you to lead you to fully fulfill the plans that he has for you. You see, he, he could just, God could just say, I forgive you. Now go and do life on your own. But God said, I know what's going to happen if you do that. You're going to screw it up. So I'm not leaving you alone. I'm going to give the Holy Spirit who's going to lead you to the very place that I have for you. This is why Paul says in verse 4, 14, he says, for, or sorry, he says in verse 4, he says, we no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it incredible when God says, I really want to begin to change you and lead you. He could have said, you know what? I'm going to send an angel. 
I'm going to send a prophet. I'm going to send a teacher. And that would have been incredible, wouldn't it? But God says, I want to do something better. I want to take a residency within you, and I want to personally lead you. You. That's how much God cares for you. He says, so instead of following the leadings of our sinful desires and nature, now the Holy Spirit is leading us into better places. He's constantly leading us. So verse 6, verse 5, I'm sorry. He says, for those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the flesh and their desires, but those who live according with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Here's how the Spirit leads you. The Spirit leads you by creating desires within you that you didn't have before. Desires to please God, to honor God, to pursue God. Th- those desires that come upon you and, and you just go, okay, I just, I just want to worship in this moment. That's not from the flesh, that's from the Spirit. Hey, I, I, need to, I want to read the Word of God and the Word of God comes alive to you. That's not you, that's the Holy Spirit. And so God is personally moving by creating new desires within you so that you have desires to please and honor and follow God. And he says, so I've given you the Holy Spirit to create new desires that were not there before to give you the desires you need. This is why one of the greatest prayers I pray over and over again is, God, I don't have a desire, so will you create the desire within me? Because God, you're leading me, so create the desires with, that you have for him, with, that are within me. And it was this next verse, this next verse that I remember reading as a college freshman. And this one verse changed my life. In fact, it's, I would not be standing here as your pastor if it wasn't for on that night coming across this passage and reading it. Because my whole entire life, I've led by what I wanted. I led with my desires and my wants and my cares and my ambition. And I thought the burden of life was based on what I wanted to do. And if I could just lead me, I would end up happy. But at that point, I realized that me leading me wasn't going to lead anywhere good. And I remember one night coming to Romans 8 and reading this incredible verse. It was like a, it was as if a light went off in the middle of a dark room. And for the first time, I could see. Where God says, for the mind that is governed or set by the flesh is death. That God says, you've been living your whole life set on the desires of what you want, and it's creating more death. It's death. But, and here's the good news, but the mind, the mind that is set on, consumed, saying, Spirit, lead me where you want to lead me. That mind, the Spirit, will always lead you to a place of life and peace. Breakthrough comes when you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit of God has lived within you to lead you to life and peace. And I remember, I remember as a college freshman, I got up the next day and it was so on my chest because I was so scared of God leading me. I was scared. And I kept holding on because I knew my plans that I had for me. And I wanted to lead me. But I kept holding on to that, realizing if I had on to this, it was not going to lead me to peace. It wasn't going to lead me to the breakthrough of life that I wanted. And if I was going to live, I wanted to live. And so I remember just getting up the next moment and just going out in the woods and walking and saying, God, I just want more of you, more of you, more of you. And I remember just hearing this verse, then give me the fullness of your life. Allow me to lead you. And I remember getting down on my face in the middle of the woods, digging a hole so I could breathe literally my face in the ground and praying, God, if this word is true, I give you my whole entire life. I don't want to be led by the flesh anymore. I want to be led by the spirit because I believe that you can bring breakthrough, that you can allow me to experience life and peace. And I'm telling you, that decision changed my life forever. God says, I'm willing to lead you. I'm willing to lead you and direct you. You're not in this alone. You're not in this alone. You're not in this alone. For the mind that is governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. For those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible. You, however, you're not in the realm of the flesh. You don't live in the things of this world. No, no, no. You're in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. So where does the spirit of God live? In me. The moment you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Not a partial aspect. But the Spirit comes and says, I'm going to take a residency in your life. And I'm not leaving. This is why you can't go back to your old ways. This is why when you try to go back to your old ways, you're miserable. And you're going, I I used to be able to do this and nothing would happen. But now I go back to this and there's misery there. And God says, that's because I took a residency in you. 
That wherever you go, you bring the spirit of God with you. That God says, I haven't left you alone. I've taken up residency. That I'm not leaving you. In the middle of your struggle, in the middle of your difficulty, God says, you're not alone. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm living in you. You have the fullness of the Holy Spirit within you. You, not just me. You do. And so he can say, verse 10, but if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And so though I'm outwardly might be wasting away inwardly, I'm being renewed because the spirit of God is creating life within me. Well, how do you know the spirit has the power to do it? Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, so the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is now the same power living in me, he will also... He will also, just as he gave life to Christ, will also give life to your mortal bodies. Why? Because the spirit who lives in you. You you think Paul wanted to get something across to us? The spirit lives in you. The spirit lives in you. The moment you believe in Christ, the spirit lives within you. This is why you can have confidence. Because you're going, I don't know what to do. The spirit is in you. He's going to lead you. What the spirit starts, the spirit will complete. This is our hope. He says, this is how we have confidence that I'm never alone. I'm never alone. I'm never alone. Push somebody say, you're not alone. I know what you're going through. You think you are, but you're not. The moment you receive Christ, the spirit is upon you. So verse 12, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Well, what are we to do? But it's not the flesh to live according to it. No, for if you live by according to the flesh. Guess what? You're going to die. You keep following that, it's going to end in death. You keep doing what you want to in your relationships, your relationships will die. You keep doing what you want to do in your life, it's going to end up in brokenness, death. But if by the Spirit, now catch who's working here, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You see where the Spirit is always leading you? The Spirit is leading you to turn away from the things that you used to live for, creating new desires within you to take you to the very place of life that he has for you. You're not alone in life. This is why Paul says, I I have some confidence. My confidence is knowing that God will personally lead me through all the craziness of my life that I'm going through. God will personally lead me. What what, what does he want to lead me to? Verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. See, the Spirit has a purpose. That purpose is not only to personally lead you, but to allow you to experience what it means to be a child of the living God. See, here's another one. I can be confident because I know what God did. What did God do? That God lovingly adopts me as his child. That God lovingly adopts you as a child. That he really cares for you. Verse 15, look what Paul says. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves. So that you live in fear. Anytime you live in fear, it's not the spirit of living God. The spirit of living God cannot live in fear. You you can't live in fear if you know you're perfectly loved. So how do you know you're perfectly loved? That's, That's what Paul's trying to get to. He says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. You see, I live in fear If I go to God and I think that I'm a slave to God, if I go to God thinking that he's a taskmaster and I I have to earn something from him, if I go to God and I think I have to earn something based on what I did, I'm going to live in fear because I'll always try to measure up and think I can't measure up. And so you'll spend your life wondering, what do I have to do to make God love me? What do I have to do to make God bless me? What do I have to do to live in God's favor? What do I got to do? What do I got to do? And we get so consumed. And then when we fail, we go, okay, now I feel so hopeless and I feel so, so broken. I feel so trapped. I feel like I can't get out of this because I feel stuck and I keep doing the things I hate that I keep doing. And you get so consumed on it. You're sitting here and you're wondering, could God really ever forgive me? Could God ever really love me? Could God ever want me again? And Paul says, you're thinking that way. You're thinking by spirit of fear. But God has not given you a spirit of fear. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. God says, I don't want you wondering, have I done enough? I don't want you questioning my love. 
I never want you walking around going, okay, God, I bet maybe the reason I lost my job is because you're mad at me because of what I did five years ago. God says, that's a lie. It's amazing how much we talk to God what God says I'm not talking about. God says, I've forgiven you of that, and I haven't given you a spirit of fear. No, I've given you the spirit to come as a child. I don't want you to live as a slave. And by him, by the spirit, we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Now, they're not talking about some 70s disco band that you like getting funky to on the weekend at times. No, the word Abba actually is a, is a word of endearment. It, 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 it's, a, it's a tender word that a kid would call a father. It's Abba, it's daddy. The spirit creates within me a desire, an intimacy that I have with God that I begin to understand that I come to God as a father. Do, do you believe that? Do you believe that you can come to God as a father? That you can cry, daddy, and he listens. Poppy, and he listens. He listens to you. These are, these are not theologically big words. This is words of a kid expressing their desire for their dad. For the Spirit, 16, for the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. What hit me several years back as I was reading this is when it hit me on that truth that I kept thinking that I had to do things in order for God to put up with me. When God just spoke through Romans 8 and he says, I don't put up with you. I actually love you. And I don't know if anybody's ever really told you that. That maybe no one's ever looked you in the eye and let you know God loves you. I mean, loves you. Loves you with a passion. That he says, the moment you receive my son, I make you a son. I make you a daughter of the most high God that you never have to live in fear anymore. That God just doesn't put up with you. He actually delights in you. He doesn't have to. He wants to. Do you realize that God, God actually wants to be with you because he cares for you? That's the love of a father. His love for you is unconditional. His love for you never wavers based on what you have done. His love is based on what Christ has done. And that's what gives us a confidence to know I am a child of the living God, and that is who I am. I'm a child of the living God. And so the fourth aspect we see is here's what else you can be confident about is that God passionately sustains me. So through his love, God is actually going to begin to take care of you in ways that you never thought he could possibly take care of you. In verse 26, skip down to verse 26. Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. The Spirit helps you. The Spirit helps you in our weaknesses. And it's incredible because I, I, wish that, I wish that Paul would have said, the Spirit takes away my weaknesses. Now, that's what we want, right? God, take away my weakness. I got a weakness. God, I have a weakness that I get easily agitated. I got a weakness, God, that I lose my temper. God, I got a weakness that I want to fall back into this addiction. God, I got a weakness that I can't keep doing the things that I know I shouldn't do, and I keep doing. God, I got a weakness. And I wish that Paul would say, and the Spirit takes away your weakness. But the Spirit doesn't say that. What he says is the Spirit allows the weakness to stay there so that in your weakness, the Spirit can help you to learn dependence because if God took the weakness out of you, you would stop dependent upon him and you would start dependent upon you again. So God says, I'm going to leave the weakness in there because in your weakness, if you can learn that I don't see it as a weakness, that's where I see the area where I want to apply the power of the Holy Spirit so we can say, I'm not weak, I'm strong in that area through the power of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit that lives within me. I have a power that yes, I will even boast in my weakness because I know in my weakness that God will give me the power to achieve what I need. He says, the Spirit helps you in your weakness. He knows you're weak. He knows you're weak. Come on, he knows you're 18 and you're flooded with hormones. He knows you're weak. He's been there through the arguments in your marriage and it feels like it's holding on by a string. He knows you're weak. 
He knows that you can't understand why your kids are doing what they're doing because you're a single mom and you never signed up for this and you feel like running away, but you can't run away because he already ran away. And if you run away, who's going to take care of the kids? And you feel trapped. And God says, I know you feel weak, but I'm willing to help you in your weakness. I'm going to pour out my power, not in the areas where you're strong. I'm going to pour out my power in the areas that you're weak. I know you're weak, and I'm going to provide for you exactly what you need. And so he says, in our weakness. He says, and then we don't even know what we ought to pray about. For the Spirit himself, though, intercedes for us and through us with words, with wordless groanings. The word groan is a deep emotional word. And he says, there's groans that the Spirit makes on our behalf. He says, for in he who searches our hearts, he knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit is constantly interceding for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Spirit is interceding. And this is amazing, because this is what happens. Literally, the text says, I get in situations where I groan. Do you ever get in situations where you groan? I feel the older I get, I groan about a lot of stuff. Oh, my shoes are on the ground. Oh, I got to, I actually got to lean down and tie my shoe. Oh, oh, I'm always groaning. And we go through life and, and we see situation. We go, ah, oh. and we don't even know what to say because you feel so trapped. You feel so overwhelmed. You, you feel like I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I feel like every time I go forward, I feel like I'm getting punched. Every time I do what's right, I feel that wrong happens. Every time I try to make amends, it seems that I just complicate the issue. And I feel like I just don't know what to do. And I'm at my wit's end because I feel so anxious because I worry to death. And I don't have a good night's sleep in a long time because every time I get up in the middle of the night, my mind won't stop racing because my mind is just filled with all the what ifs and what ifs and what ifs and what ifs and what ifs. And I feel so weak and I just don't know what to pray. And I feel so bad because at that moment, moment, the evil one comes to you and says, you see, you would have more if you would just pray more. And then you feel even more guilty because you're going, I don't even know what to pray. In that moment, you have to realize, hold up. In my groans, the spirit hears my groaning and the spirit of living God begins to groan on my behalf in the presence of God, that the spirit begins to pray exactly what I need, exactly when I need it. The spirit begins to intercede for me so that I am never, ever, ever, ever at a loss. He's always providing exactly what I need, exactly when I need it. And it's always right on time as I come before the living God. This is why Paul says, I can't fail in this. This is why it says, I have the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is interceding for me. I don't know how to pray, but the Spirit prays for me. And every time I groan, the Spirit takes my groaning, and he knows exactly what I need, exactly when I need it. I'm confident. I'm confident that the Spirit is leading me And the Spirit is directing me, and the Spirit is taking care of me, and the Spirit will bless me. I am confident, I am confident, I am confident that God will completely take care of me. I'm confident. Do you realize that never comes a point in your life where the Spirit of the living God is not giving you exactly what you need and the power you need in order to accomplish what he's called you to do? Never. 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 And so Paul says, this is how I have a confidence. Because I know what God did. What else God, did God do, Paul? He said, God victoriously fights for my good in every situation that I face. He fights for my good. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what heartache or situations you're facing, God is working for your good in every situation. And Paul pins perhaps one of the most greatest promises that we find in all of Scripture. Romans 8, 28. For we know, we know. What do we know, Paul? That in all things. Shout all things. All things. things. Because typically I think it's all things are good things. But all things means bad things too. Good things means... On wedding day, bad things means divorce day. 
Good days mean the days I get the job. Bad days mean the days that I lose the job. Good days when the test results come back and I'm cancer free. Bad days when the cancer has continued to multiply. Paul says, I know that in all things, it's not me working. In all things, God works for the good. Not just the good of everybody. No, no, no. Those who love him. You see those who made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Those who love him, who have been called according to his glorious Amazing purpose. Well, how can I be sure that God is going to work out for my good? Here's his logic. Verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. Now, Paul's not trying to create a theological fight. We created more theological fights based on this passage. His his purpose is not to have a fight. His purpose is to give assurance. He says, oh, you, you think God's saving grace and God's goodness just kind of showed up on the scene out of nowhere. No, 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 no. In eternity past, God foreknew exactly what he was going to do. This isn't a mistake. God knew you would screw up. That's why he chose you in eternity past. He knew you would blow it. He knew you would fail, but he didn't set his love and affection on you because how great you were. He set his, he set his love and his affection upon you because how great he was. For God, what he foreknew, which means he knew in the past, he predestined, which means God chose you. Do you realize that God chose you? Before you ever showed up to choose God, he already chose you. And he says, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He says, I, I know what I will complete in your life. I will make you exactly like Christ Jesus in fullness of form, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So, so what, does that, what does that mean, Paul? How, how, do, we, how do we do that? What, what do you mean? He says, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified, which means he makes you completely right with him. And those he justified, he also, and it's interesting. He says, and he glorified. Paul's looking at you, and he sees the future you that's not even there yet. And he says, I know you'll get there. I know there will come a day where you'll be fully glorified when you look back and the power of sin is no more, that you'll look back and every tear has been shed will be no more, that God will fully make you in the fully blessing that he has for you, that God is going to complete what he started and there will come a day. He speaks in future tense of what hasn't happened yet. That's how assured Paul is that he looks at you and says, don't you understand that salvation from beginning to end was all about God? And if he started it, he's going to complete it because that's how faithful he is to you. And it's never been about your faithfulness. It's always been about his faithfulness and his goodness and his grace and his mercy and his love and his kindness and his power poured out upon us when we least deserve it. That he says from beginning to end, God's got this. God's got you. From beginning to end, he knew where you would be right now, right in this situation. He knew what he was doing. And he says, I'm not giving up on you. I'm not done with you. I know where it ends up. I know what's going to accomplish. So what then? Verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for me, if God is for me, if God is for me, who can be against me? If God is for me, come on. If God is for me. You see, this is confidence. If God is for me, then who can ever stand against me? Who can stand against me if my God is for me? Well, how for me is he? Oh, you wondered that too? (laughs) He who did not spare his own son. Oh, but gave him up for us all. How will you not also along with him graciously give us all things? How committed is he? He's willing to die for you. How committed is he? He's willing to step out of heaven for you. How committed is he? He's willing to give everything for you so that Paul says, catch his logic. If he's willing to give his son for me, don't you think he's going to take care of everything else for me? 
If he's willing to give his son for me, don't you think he's going to take care of my paycheck when I need it? If he's so for me, don't you think he's going to take care of the food I need? Don't you think he's going to give me the wisdom to raise the kids? Don't you think he's going to give me the power I need to stand strong? Don't you think he's going to give me the understanding to endure through the difficulties that I'm in? If he's that for me and he's willing to give his son, isn't he going to graciously give us all things? So who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Listen to what God did for you. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. For Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So not only is the Spirit interceding for us, now Christ the Son is interceding for us. Don't you see the Trinity through this? You have God the Father says, I love you and I adopted you. God the Spirit says, I'm going to take up residency within you to make sure it gets completed. And God the Son says, I'm going to die for you so that you never have to be condemned, condemned again. And Paul says, this is how we get confidence. We have a triune God working for our good in every situation, no matter what we go through. And so who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or my stupid decisions or your stupid decisions? As it is written, for your sake, we face death death all day long. And many people look at us and we're considered as sheep into the slaughter. He's saying, you know, people look at your life and you're going through a difficulty and you're going through trouble. And and in your mind and in your life and in your testament, you're going, I don't know how this is going to end, but I know that God is going to take care of me. And people look at you and go, you're just stupid. You see them, they're they're, they're trusting God. And what has God done for them lately? They're still struggling. They're still hurting. If their God is so good, why are they still stuck in that? If their God is so great, then why are they still dealing with that? And they look at us and they laugh at us and they think about us and they say, how pitiful are you to trust in some God that is not doing anything for you? And Paul says, that's what the world says. The world looks at us and they think we're just stupid sheep that we've trusted in the living God and we have no hope. But Paul says, no, no, shout no. No, in all these things, what you thought was my demise is not my demise. What you thought was the end is not the end. What you thought was going to be my defeat is not my defeat. What you thought was a waste of time. What you thought was a waste of prayers. What you thought it was going to end up in tragedy. What you thought was going to end up in brokenness. What you thought was going to end in addiction. What you thought was going to end up in just another statistic. What you thought was over wasn't over because the God that I serve, I might look like a sheep, but you don't know the shepherd that I serve. For I know that in all things, all things, all things, I am more, I'm more than a conqueror. Not through me, not through what I can do, not through my power, my smarts, my strength, my ability, my moral. But through him who set his love upon me. Paul says, this is why I'm confident. This is why I can rejoice. This is why I can begin to proclaim. This is why I can go from Romans 7, I'm worthless, to Romans 8, for I am convinced. Now we know what convinces you, Paul. For I am convinced, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor broken things, nor my own decisions, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in and through Christ Jesus, for his love is for me. And Paul says, when I focus on what I did, I live miserable. But when I focus on what God did, I'm forever transformed. I'm forever transformed. So where's your confidence? Yes, you'll blow it. Yes, you'll sin. Yes, you'll struggle. Yes, you'll go through life and you go, what's going on? Where will your confidence be? Is your confidence, well, this is what I did? Or is your confidence saying, this is what my God did? And I'm trusting what he did, not what I did. Will you pray with me right now, all of our locations? Come on, I believe that God is moving. And I believe right now in all of our locations and I'm Journey Church anywhere, there's some of you there, you're struggling. 
as soon as I'm done, we're going to have prayer teams both online and in our in-person locations that would love to pray for you. Maybe work some things out that you've been struggling with. Before you go, will you talk to somebody online? Will you reach out to somebody? Just hit that prayer button. Just speak to somebody. But right now, in all of our locations, we just say, God, I, I need you. God, it's not about what I did, but God, it's about what you did. And so, God, I'm not focusing on what I did. I'm focusing on what you did for me. God, this is where I find my hope. This is where I find my strength. God, I'm trusting in you. And have you ever done that? Have you ever truly gotten to the point where you say, Jesus, I need you to save me from me? Romans 8 is the most powerful passage in all the Bible because in the most in-depth, most powerful points that Paul makes, he reveals to us the depth of God's love for you and what God is willing to do for you. But you have to make a decision. Will you choose? Will you decide? You say, God, I want to follow you. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for to be my sin offering so that I never have to bear the weight of sin anymore. Forgive me. Spirit of living God, lead me personally. And God, allow me to understand I'm not a slave in fear anymore. I'm a child of the living God. And God, in those moments where I'm at my weakest, remind me that you are spirit of the living God. You are helping me. You're interceding for my good. And God, I can ultimately know and trust that you're going to work out good in my situation. Because God, my faith is in the reality that if it's not good yet, it means you're not done yet. So I'm trusting what you could do. And I put my hope, I put my trust in you. This is where my confidence comes. My confidence is found in nothing else but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Thank you for hope. Thank you for Romans 8 that gives us reason to shout and reason to sing and reason to rejoice no matter what we're going through. Thank you that we can say, what can separate me from the love of God? We can say nothing, for I am loved in and through Christ Jesus. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Give God a shout of the biggest praise you can. <laughs>